and it may I want to make sure it's useful as much as possible for you. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple questions that I wanted to ask. Um, the first one is, uh, what are some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome as an electric string player in a dominantly electric guitar world? Excellent question. Extremely briefly, as far as the time period, you have to understand that um, when I was your age, uh, there was nothing for strings. Mm -hmm. Zero. Except a little fiddling and all classical, and of course, neither of which I wanted to pursue. I wanted to play rock and roll and electric playing. So um, I would show up at auditions that were bands that were looking for lead guitar players. I would show up and not tell them that I played violin, because the second I told them I played violin, they would kick me out. So I would plug in without them seeing me and start to riff on my playing. And then, of course, they immediately jumped. And uh, nine times out of ten, I got the relationship and the gig. But I found that the most important thing is it when you're playing an electric instrument is that it's not just a loud violin. The most important part of your electric presentation, um, and this is real important, Elizabeth, that I really, uh, you know, I want you to emphasize, is that when you play an electric instrument in a particular style, let's say I'm a rock guy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I play, you have to hear the essence, not just G sharps and A naturals, you need to hear and taste and smell rock and roll oozing, dripping out of my fingers so that nobody ever will say to you, oh my God, that sounds like a classical violin player struggling to play a blues scale. And that sort of uh, uh, permeates our string world so much is that people plug a violin in and then immediately assume that they're a rock player or a jazz player. And it's all in the playing. I can pick up an acoustic instrument and it sounds rock and roll because I know how to make that sound from my hands. Um, focus me a little bit. I'm not sure if I've gotten on off on a tangent. Um, well, kind of going off of that, how did you find that it was best to market yourself as a string player? Okay, marketing is real important. When somebody sees a picture of you, it has to be absolutely instantaneous what it is that you're seeing mm -hmm. especially now um it was said back then when i was going out but but now especially people are much more visually driven so you have to have a visual sense of who you are um although you know i've seen country artists go out looking like rock and rollers um uh, so you know it's sort of a, a, a changed a little bit but uh, your image is important and the way you market yourself so how do you think um, we get the world to look at electric, just strings in general, or electric strings differently, since um, we are seen as kind of uptight and just strictly classical, and a lot of people don't know the other side of what string playing can be? Yep, with the technology right now, Elizabeth, as you know, um, it's, gonna, it's, changed, it's changed your life and my life. The technology that you can get a YouTube out there of you rocking out in mm -hmm. a style that's not typical of what people think. And then it backs up to perception. My entire career, still to this day, this morning, tomorrow, is... Oh, you play violin? Oh, that means this. So it's all about uh, changing perception. And I think that uh, I think that what is really helpful for you, your mission, and your colleagues and friends out in Belmont, your mission is to change perception more than creating the perfect note. Changing perception is truly your um, goal. Uh, because mm -hmm. that's what we are still struggling to this day, is that the people still equate violin with either fiddling or classical. Mm -hmm. And jazz violin, God, that's so gone at this point as far as a reality, unfortunately, because I love jazz violin. But there's so little going on in that world. The only real world that, that has opportunity for you and your generation is, believe it or not, in rock. And I'm totally happy with that. <laughs> totally happy with that. Because that's where the action is. That's where the essence of music is, is rock and roll. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if your teachers will agree with that, but I do. <laughs> some will and some, some won't, but um, I'm thankful that I have some teachers here that definitely support what I'm doing with the Viper and all that kind of thing, so that's good. Um, so, as an innovator in the string world, through orchestras and school systems and through the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, um, what you do is really different from anything that most people know about strings. So, where and with whom did you face the most resistance and how did you get past that? <laughs> oh my god. I'm trying, I, 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 I wish I could be... Well, I will try to um, clarify uh, an answer to you without pointing fingers. That's a <laughs> tough one. Um, things are shifting right now, and I have literally had to ban from my Facebook the old school 60-year-old violin teachers. We posted a, um, a, a T-shirt of a cello with a, a skull and crossbones on this on the cello or something mm -hmm. like that and it was skull and crossbows right yeah it's brilliant <laughs> really of course they flipped out they posted <laughs> on my face we do not want this image of our classical or our string players to the world like this mark shame on you do you think that it's more is it more with teachers that are trying to keep the new generation like on the straight and narrow of the classical world, or do you find that it's a little bit of both, where it's it's people my age or, and younger, or young adults and teachers? Um, which do you find that you meet the most resistance with? The biggest driver, and this is also a handicap, Elizabeth, listen real carefully. The biggest handicap in string pedagogy is the teacher-student relationship. Think about that, that you can't even lift a finger or blink without permission from your teacher. That um, does, not, uh, does not encourage innovation. It does not encourage individuality. Um, the greatest innovators of music, Elizabeth, in the last 50 years have been musicians who have not been trained. Okay, I'm going to say that again because this is your thesis this is your the epicenter of your what you're thinking about the innovation that has happened in the last 40 years we're talking Jimi Hendrix Miles Davis John Coltrane Duke Ellington Leonard Bernstein uh, Frank Zappa Led Zeppelin the Beatles all this incredible music that turned a minuscule music industry into a multi-billion dollar industry and created music that resonates around the world from blues to rock to country music that music has been the instigator of the most important revolution uh, since Beethoven's time. And not one of those musicians was trained. Not one of those musicians, maybe they took a couple of months lessons and that was it. Because back in the 60s, no one knew how to teach it. So Jimi Hendrix, how is he gonna, how is he gonna learn that stuff? Guess what? He taught himself. Thus, creating originality, innovation, creativity, and changing of perception. And that is the definition of an artist. So going back to the thing you were saying about the musicians, you know, the Beatles and, and Zeppelin and all, and Hendrix not being trained, where do you think that leaves us now in the music industry um, as far as string players go, or just anybody in the music industry, um, because it is so precise and it's so corrected and auto-tuned and, and a lot of times, you know, when you turn on the radio, I don't feel like there's that connection right. or that feeling anymore. How do you think that we get back to that as musicians just in well, the industry live, in general? Live performance is pretty much the, the essence of, of your life right now, unless you're going to be a teacher. Either you're going to be a teacher in a university or a private teacher um, or you're going to be a performing musician. Those are the only choices you really do have. And um, if you can go out in front of an audience and connect them with your playing um, that's not auto-tuned, and there will be mistakes, mm -hmm. and you uh, create a connection with your fan base, you will have a gr um, uh, you'll survive the day. You may not survive the whole career because longevity is another topic that you need to think about. 
Mm -hmm. is not only do you have to make a living today, you have to do this for the rest of your life, Elizabeth. And that's the beauty and power of being self-employed and an entrepreneur or musician nowadays. I think we've got the next wave because with help from you and your friends and colleagues, um, we're going to shift the paradigm. So I think that with a... Uh, with auto-tune and the technology that's available right now, um, it is hard to decipher between somebody who's truly talented mm -hmm. and somebody who's not as talented, especially when you hear vocals. Um, you know, that, that that's just the way of the world right now. Pete, the listener is now so used to perfection that a live performance, you have to be even more accurate with your performance. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely challenging these times. Just to kind of wrap this up, what is one thing or a couple points that you have taken away from all of your experience in the the industry and as a string player and recording and playing and touring, you know, being on the road, um, that you would tell somebody like me or your average college student who's trying to make it um, doing what you do and making a living, sustaining yourself through music? A couple of things. If you're pursuing it as a performance major and I, you, you're, you love performing... I, you know, I love performing, but I also still get nervous and I still get anxiety. Um, it's not something that, well, I, I, I love performing, but I'm really nervous, so I don't perform. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. I love performing, and I push myself to do that. So your performance is, is, is an essential part of revenue at this point. You cannot make music selling records or CDs anymore. So your living is based a lot on your presentation physically, musically, and the way you engage the audience. I think that being different and being yourself. The thing about Elizabeth, what I think that, that, that is so important and that which classical training is poisons is an individual. Like for me to listen to, oh, Mark, hey, Mark, I'm working on the Mozart violin sonatas. You know what I'd say? I have no care whatsoever to hear that. I'm sure you're playing at fine, Elizabeth, and God bless you. I just practiced Bach all morning. But if you're out in public, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear Elizabeth. So what does Elizabeth have to say for herself? She's got this cool hair. She's got this cool <laughs> violin. She plays her ass off. I want to hear who you are, and that is your future, is that you need to spend every waking second having a diary, a journal, find out who you are, what your strengths are, what you love about life, and hopefully, hopefully, other people will want to hear your viewpoint on life through your music. And that is the essence, and that's going to be the only way that you're going to survive a long career. For two months, you can pretend you're a fiddler in a uh, you know dance band. That you can do. That's okay. But in the long run, you have to always, in other words, somebody's got to say, oh, I know who to call. Let's call Elizabeth up. She's cool. She's fun. She's rocking. And she knows how to play the, her ass off. Let's call her. That's what you start developing. Not, oh, God, she's one of 30 violin players I know that can sort of fake her way around being a fake musician because she's so classically poisoned. You don't want to be associated with that world. Because that world is, is, is pretty much 99% of our string world. What you need to do and what musicians need to do in the next uh, 50 years is establishing very personal and very, very dynamic um, uh, experiences. And, and the funny thing, uh, Elizabeth, this permeates your, your private life too. Because then you start really thinking about is how do you engage somebody, whether it's a friend or whether it's uh, an acquaintance, the whole dynamic of your body language, the way you present yourself, your eyes, everything is being judged by that person you're talking to. And either they write you off saying, oh my God, I can't stand hanging out with this person. Yeah, but they're a great violin player. Yeah, but I can't stand hanging out with them. You're not going to get the gig. I hire, <clears throat> depending on what the gig is, I hire guitar players, bass players, and drummers. They have to be excellent musicians. But if their personalities are very complementary to mine, they got the gig, as opposed to the violin player. So well, that's what we struggle with, is that you would never hear that from a, a saxophone player, a guitar player, mm -hmm. who would show up the gig. Because guitar players know how to hang, they know how to be cool, they yeah. know how to um, uh, interact with humans. 
And that's, that's a really, really important thing that you got to think about is the way we, our personalities are and the way we present ourselves to, to the world.